my family in Christ. A couple of years ago, Noelle Hancock lived in Manhattan and had a salary of almost $100,000 a year. But she gave it all up. She gave it all up so that she could scoop ice cream in an ice cream parlor. Now maybe that's not the completely why reason, but instead she specifically gave up her job to scoop ice cream in the Caribbean. She sold everything that she had, she quit her job, and she took on a minimum wage job in the Caribbean and scooped ice cream. She gave up all of essentially what was the American dream that her parents had wanted her to have, and she gave it all up because she was unhappy. She wanted to be someplace warm, she wanted to be somewhere that with a slower pace of life, so she left it all behind. Kind of a countercultural move, right? Noelle went to Yale University, got an excellent job. It's everything her parents had ever wanted for her. She gave it all up for something different. But now maybe a different situation. Maybe you've heard of her, Lori Hernandez. Last year she was on the U.S. Olympic gymnast team. 16 years old last year and yet had a scholarship to the University of Florida for gymnastics. That's what you want, right? Have a full ride scholarship to a good university. But she gave it all up. Shortly before the Olympics, she announced that she was going to become a professional gymnast for at least the next four years, and that means she couldn't have the scholarship anymore. She gave up the scholarship to pursue her dream. She said that she just couldn't go back to the college level after competing at the highest level there was. She needed to obtain that professional gymnast glory, and there was no looking back. Now, that maybe is a little bit countercultural. We know the importance of education. We know how expensive education is, but she gave it all up for her dream. What have you given up in life? What sacrifices have you made, and for what reasons? Often, the sacrifices we make are for specific reasons, much like Noelle did. She gave up what seemed like the dream job, living in a great place, but she gave it up for what she thought was something better for herself. Lori Hernandez had a great life, a good future ahead of her, but she gave it up for something she believed would be better for her. And that's often what our sacrifices do. We often make sacrifices because we believe that these sacrifices will lead to a better life. Things will be better after I make this sacrifice. But now the Bible talks a lot about sacrifice. It talks a lot about making sacrifices, but often the sacrifice it talks about isn't for your benefit. The sacrifices the Bible talks about making do not usually aid you. Because even as we look at maybe the countercultural moves of Noel and Lori, the fact is, is that they made those sacrifices still to benefit themselves. The sacrifices the Bible talks about benefit others. Which goes in kind of the face of how we usually approach the decisions we make. Usually we want to make the best decisions to benefit me. The Bible talks about making decisions that benefit others, even at the cost to yourself. Now last week, we kind of already started talking about that concept that as God calls on us to make these kind of countercultural moves, living lives that are different than what the world says is the right thing to do, God calls on that life as, as worship. Usually we think of worship as just gathering together for that hour on Sunday mornings, but worship is your entire life, all the decisions you make. And maybe that starts to make sense, but, but worship even goes beyond what maybe is a kind of a black and white life. That the life we lead to follow God is more than just making decisions between what is sinful or not sinful. We looked at last week the concept of thinking about this, adiaphora. Here's your vocabulary lesson for the day. 
You guys are going to be so good at Scrabble after going to peace more often. Adiaphora. The adiaphora are things that something God has neither directly commanded us to do nor forbidden us from doing. So adiaphora talks about more than just what's sinful or not sinful because God's word doesn't directly address every little decision that you make, everything that you do or face every day. Especially 2,000 years later, we deal with a lot of different things that the New Testament church in Paul's time didn't have to deal with. But even though God's word doesn't directly address every situation you have every day, God gives us principles that do encapsulate everything, that help, show, help shape the way we approach all of our decisions in everyday life. Because worship of God is more than just choosing sinful or not sinful things, but it's also in the way we approach these littler decisions, these adiaphora, these things that we could do or we could not do. But how we do them, why we do them, why we don't do them, that is our way of worshiping God. So some of the principles we started looking at last week was the first one was this. That we give glory to God no matter what we do. Whatever we decide to do, whatever way we take on, a, on a, a, the topic of an adiaphora, is that it always to give glory to God. We looked at this Bible verse from 1 Corinthians 10. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That whatever you do around other people, whatever you do in private, it should, number one, give glory to God. So we're already doing something countercultural. You're already not thinking about yourself, but you're thinking about God first. The next principle we looked at was this. Oh, nope, I just totally erased the second principle. Apparently that one doesn't matter. Second principle is this, that whatever knowledge you have, you use it to build up the family of Christ. That whatever knowledge you have of your freedom as a Christian, you use that freedom to help the people around you grow in their faith. Remember, the context of this is that as Christians, we don't have a lot of prescribed ways of living. Yes, there's the moral law, but we don't have all those Old Testament ceremonial laws that the Jews had to worry about. So we have a lot of freedom in the way we approach adiaphora, a lot of freedom in the way we go about living our daily lives. But how do we use that freedom? Well, we give glory to God and we also build up the family of Christ. We help the people around us. So those two principles shape the way we approach the things that we have freedom of in this world. Now today we're going to talk about another principle, a third principle. And it's this. That gospel ministry is greater than my personal rights. Spreading the gospel, communicating what Jesus has done for both me and for the world is more important than my personal rights. Doesn't get much more countercultural than that as Americans, right? We often talk a lot about what is my right? What do I have the right to do? What, I have, what do I have the right to get? But as we're going to look at today in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul talks a lot about both his rights, rights that are real, rights that he deserves, but also why he's willing to give up those rights for the sake of the gospel. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of chunks from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to see Apostle Paul talk about the rights that belong to him and then why he was willing to set those rights aside. And hopefully that helps us think about how to prioritize our lives, how we can apply this principle to even the small decisions of life. That is, we think about what is the most important. And what's most important isn't, first of all, my rights, however real they may be, but what's most important is to give glory to God by spreading the gospel. So please follow along as we read our first section from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The Apostle Paul talks about what are his rights, rights that he deserves as an apostle and as a full-time gospel minister. So please follow along. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? 
For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? This is the word of God. Did you catch on what right he is talking about? He's talking about his right as a full-time gospel minister to receive material, physical support from the congregation. He, saw, he used examples of other jobs that everybody who has a full-time job expects to receive compensation. It's no different for a gospel minister that a worker deserves his wages. And he actually talks a little bit about this, more than just this section in this chapter, and goes on about how even in the Old Testament, those who worked in the temple, they were supported by God's people. The New Testament, even though you don't have the temple and that kind of worship, New Testament gospel ministers are still to be supported because they're contributing a full-time service to God's people. Now, that he's not talking about how God's people should be making sure that all gospel ministers have private jets in order to travel the world or have 10,000 square foot mansions. But I am thankful that as a full-time gospel minister, by the support of our congregation, I have a roof for my family's heads. I have a minivan to get my kids around. I don't have to worry about, are we going to have food the next day? That is a tremendous blessing that I, a full-time gospel minister, have. And that's something that the Apostle Paul said full-time gospel ministers, ministers in his time had too. He even references the Apostle Peter in Jerusalem. How he was married, had a family, and they were supported. And that the Apostle Paul and his teammate Barnabas, they deserved the exact same level of support. That was their right as apostles and people who brought the gospel to the Corinthians. They deserved to have that given to them. But now what did the Apostle Paul do with that right? He goes on to say this. But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. You see, at the Corinthian church, the Apostle Paul did not receive that support from the congregation because he chose not to receive it. Instead, the Apostle Paul, by trade, was a tent maker. So that's what he did. He worked at spreading the gospel, but he also applied his trade and made tents, and that's how he supported himself physically. And he did so because, remember the culture of Corinth, a port town, mostly pagan temples, lots of ideas coming in and out of the place. He was afraid that people would think his message of the gospel was for his own material benefit. And so to make sure that nobody could question his motives, he did not want to receive any material benefit from his ministry. This was a new message that was being presented to the world, a new message that Corinth had never heard before. And so the Apostle Paul wanted it to be clear that this message was solely to give glory to God, not for the glory of Paul. So he set aside his rights. Was it convenient for him to be working two full-time jobs? No. Was it easy for him to spend so much energy spreading the gospel, but also to make tents? No. But he did it anyways because he in no way wanted to risk hurting that gospel message. His number one priority was spreading the gospel of Christ. So, back to our principle, right? Gospel ministry is greater than my personal rights. Apostle Paul had every reason in the world to demand physical support from the congregation he was serving, but he set it aside because spreading the gospel, removing any sort of roadblocks was the most important thing he could do. 
What have you given up for the sake of spreading the gospel? What sacrifices have you made? Some might say having to set up a church every week. Some might say having to put up with Pastor Greg. Being here at peace, yeah. I know many of you have made sacrifices to be here. Getting up on Sunday mornings to come to church. Sacrifices made for the sake of the gospel. But have they been any real sacrifices? Or do often when we approach gospel, when we approach church work, are we still mostly concerned with what's in it for me? When we look at a church that we go to, are we concerned first and foremost about how we can serve other people or are we first and foremost concerned with what the church can do for me? When we go about living our Christian life outside of church walls, when we go about that worship in our daily lives, are we first and foremost concerned about what people will think about me? Or are we concerned first and foremost with taking opportunities to spread the gospel, no matter what people think? What have you given up for the sake of spreading the gospel message? Now maybe, maybe we have to remind ourselves, what is the gospel? The gospel is the one thing that can change a person's life for eternity. The gospel is that message that no matter who you are, whether you are working in Manhattan or the Caribbean, that you can have peace everywhere. That as you have been given peace with your God through the sacrifice of Christ, you have a peace that nothing in this world can touch. What is the gospel message? It's the message that you matter. That no matter whether or not your, your name is in the headlines because of gold medals that you won, or if your boss has a hard time remembering your name, you have significant value because God was willing to sacrifice his life for your sake. What is the gospel message? The message that you have a hope that can't be touched by terrorist attacks, by politics, by hurtful things that people say to you, you have a hope that starts now and stretches into eternity, a hope that already belongs to you because Jesus Christ has already done everything needed to give you that hope. By his sacrifice on the cross, by his victory over the grave, you have a gift that already belongs to you and nobody can take it away. This is the message that the Apostle Paul is willing to put his life on the line for, not just in Corinth, but all over. To take physical abuse, to give up his rights, to risk his life so that all people everywhere could know this message that would change eternity for them. What have you given up? Well, maybe to think about how we can approach applying this principle to our daily life, let's go on to see how the Apostle Paul applied it in specific ways. Let's look at our next set of verses. He said, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though myself am not under the law so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of God. Now maybe that first part, little tongue twister, is talking about the law over and over again. But the Apostle Paul's specific situation, talking about how he reached out to the Jews who still kind of lived out those ceremonial laws, the Apostle Paul was sensitive to that and respected those laws just like they did when he was around them. But when he was around Gentiles, he didn't live as though he needed to live according to those ceremonial laws. Why? 
He didn't want them to think that they had to become Jewish in order to be Christian. So the Apostle Paul changed the way he lived depending on who he was around. Again, maybe that seems like a countercultural idea. Because we're so focused on the importance usually in our identity, right? We never want to give up our right to be who we are for the sake of somebody else. But yet the Apostle Paul was willing to do whatever it took to make sure he could be around people and present the gospel in a way that they would listen and trust it. But now, what this doesn't mean is that when we go around people, we, we also don't change ourselves in a way that would be not pleasing in God's eyes. This doesn't mean that in order to, to win the racists, we have to be like racists. In order to win the gossips, we have to be gossipers. Or to win the drunks, we have to be drunks. That's not what the Apostle Paul is saying. He said he still lived under Christ's law. That means he still lived a Christ-like life. He never compromised his Lord. What he compromised was his personal preferences. What he compromised were things that made him feel comfortable or not comfortable. He made his personal sacrifices about Adiaphra for the sake of other people getting to hear an eternal, life-changing message. So like he said, he had freedom. He was a slave to no one. And yet he lived as a slave to everyone. Why? Because the gospel ministry was more important than his personal preferences or rights. Even though through the gospel of Christ, he had a lot of freedom to do a lot of different things. Because he loved sharing that gospel message with others and knew it was so important, he put other people first. Now that affects the decisions we make a lot. That affects maybe the way we worship. That we would never compromise the message of Christ. We never would compromise the way the Holy Spirit comes to us through the Word and through baptism and through the Lord's Supper. But maybe the way we go about our worship, the things that the Bible doesn't talk about, the way we present the sacraments and God's Word, maybe we do them in a way that makes sure that anybody who walks through the doors is know that they're welcome and know that these things apply to them. Maybe as we think about the way we talk about our faith in front of other people, we know that there's a whole huge variety of ways we could talk about it. But maybe we want to focus on is communicating in our faith that's going to be understandable to people, whether they have a lot of church background or no church background. Maybe as we consider the way we talk about our opinions on things that have nothing to do with church, things that maybe we get really heated about and have lots of opinions about, Maybe we think twice about the way we talk about them when we're around other people. So we never put up roadblocks when we want to talk about the gospel. So that the people around us, no matter what their opinions are, whatever their background is, whatever they look like, wherever they're from, that they always know that we love them and want them to know this eternal life-changing message. And yes, that might mean putting aside personal preferences. That might mean doing things that at first feel uncomfortable. But if it means getting to share the gospel, what wouldn't we be willing to give up? That's what the Apostle Paul means by this, that I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. That getting to share the gospel, the message that the Holy Spirit God himself works through. Getting the opportunity to share that gospel message is worth feeling uncomfortable. It's worth making sacrifices. Because if it means that even a few people can be impacted by the power of the Holy Spirit, all the sacrifices have been worth it. So what will we give up? How often will we be uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel? Does this mean that our personal rights and our own growth in our relationship with God doesn't matter? By no means. And the Apostle Paul addresses it at the end of this chapter here. He says this, 
Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run it in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Apostle Paul is talking about how it is hard to live a Christ-like life. It is hard to be a disciple. And so he acknowledges that it takes discipline. He makes the comparison to the kind of Olympic-style games that took place in Corinth. It says those athletes train so hard to win a prize. What kind of prize? A prize that doesn't last. A, a, a laurel, a crown of branches that decays to win the glory and admiration of others that the next year everybody is going to forget? No, he says that kind of glory doesn't matter. What we're fighting for is a glory that lasts forever. A glory that's already been handed to us by the perfect work of Christ. A glory that's guaranteed. The people that we looked at at the beginning of today, Noel, she set aside uh, riches and a life that seemed comfortable for the sake of peace on a beach. But we know that that peace doesn't last either. Lori Hernandez set aside a comfortable education for the sake of obtaining Olympic glory and professional glory. But we know that in 15 years, we might not even remember who she is. You and I, when we prioritize the decisions we make, we understand that when we make those decisions for the glory of God, we're doing eternal things. We're doing work that has an impact that lasts forever. Whether it's on our own life or on somebody else's, it doesn't matter. We want to give up all of it for the sake of eternity, for the sake of that gospel. So that means as you make those sacrifices and approach those different decisions and opportunities in your life, that's actually for your own benefit too. That as you go through the discipline of giving glory to God first, thinking about how to build up the family of Christ and finding new ways to share the gospel, that really is for your own benefit. That you grow in your endurance and strength as a believer as you know the proper priorities and principles to apply in your daily life. So what will you do as you leave the doors today? How will you approach all these different opportunities in your life to worship your God? Will you live it in a way that is culturally appropriate to this world, or will you be countercultural and live according to the gospel message, this gift that has already been given to you? You have the benefit of it. Now let's share that benefit with others, no matter the cost. No matter the sacrifice it takes to make sure that all people everywhere know that the peace we have through Christ Peace belongs to them. Whatever they look like, whatever they've done, wherever they've been from, our Savior is for them too. It doesn't get much more countercultural than that. Amen. Please pray with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, so often maybe we approach our church life and relationship with you with, first of all, thinking about what we can get out of it. Help us to instead think about how we can give glory to you by sharing your gospel message with everybody around us, no matter what it takes. Whatever we have to give up, let us, first of all, give thanks to you for the relationship that our Savior has given to us, and to give thanks for the opportunities you present us to share that eternal life-changing message with anybody at any time in whatever way we may. Give us the strength to do this, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.